Air Force One is the descriptor for any aircraft, Air Force aircraft carrying the President of the United States. But to Avgeeks, it generally refers to a highly customized Boeing 747-200, military designation VC-25 Alpha, with the unique Raymond Lowy designed paint livery. It is a powerful symbol of the United States of America and commands a presence wherever it travels. Serving as a mobile command center for the president when he travels, it features over 4,000 square feet of space accommodating the president, his staff, entourage, and a small traveling press pool. Many wonderful and detailed books have been written on the history of aircraft that have transported the president. In 1985, the VC-137 Charlie was reaching nearly 25-year service. As a result, the United States Air Force began to plan for a replacement aircraft. After internal requirements had been set, the USAF began to send out requests for proposals RFP to Boeing, Lockheed, and McDonnell Douglas. General John Mitchell Lowe was appointed to Air Force Director of Operational Requirements in 1985, and Lowe's job was to find a replacement aircraft and suitable proposals for the aging VC-137 Charlies. There were really only two choices at the time of his new RFP from the Air Force, the Boeing 747 and the McDonnell Douglas DC-10. Lockheed's L-1011 had ceased production, not to mention it barely met the endurance requirements of the Air Force had set, and Lockheed wasn't about to build an all-new aircraft for the VC-137 Charlie replacement nor restart the L-1011 production line. Boeing, of course, offered the Boeing 747-200 aircraft even though the Boeing 747-300 had entered the service two years prior. The 747-200 had more in common with the current fleet of the E-4B Doomsday aircraft. The Advanced Airborne Command Post that were flying for the United States Air Force. Boeing knew that with the E-4Bs flying, the current presidential aircraft being a Boeing with four engines, and that the 747 easily met or exceeded all operational requirements. It had the advantage to, to walk away with the contract award. Boeing was also keenly aware that both Lockheed and McDonnell Douglas had no interest in competing for what they viewed as a sole sourced competition that had already been decided in their view. What happened next week was chronicled in Air and Space Weekly in a fascinating article by Lara Seligman back in 2016. Seligman interviewed General Lowe for an article that discussed the latest acquisition of the Boeing 747-8 to fulfill the role as the next Air Force One carrier. According to the article, Boeing met with Lowe and presented its proposal. Two Boeing 747-200 aircraft retrofitted with all the custom fitment, countermeasures, and other operational requirements that the Air Force requested at just under $1 billion in 1985 which is equally, roughly equally 2.4 billion adjusted for inflation in 2020. Boeing was in for a rude awakening. The list price for the Boeing 747-200 in 1985 was 112 million for green aircraft, which is new, or 224 million for two aircrafts. And this was the list price before discounting, which generally occurs in the airlines. Boeing was then adding nearly four times the cost of the aircraft for customization and fitment to meet the Air Force requirements. Lowe was reportedly furious at the estimate and knew that unless he had a viable and alternative proposal, he'd had very little leverage against Boeing's proposal. McDonnell Douglas was already 100% focused on their struggling C-17 Globemaster III airlifter Facing delays, cost overruns, and the threat of cancellation, Lowe convinced McDonnell Douglas to compete for the Air Force One replacement. Seligman reported that Lowe already knew the DC-10 was a viable alternative to the 747, and with McDonnell Douglas struggling, Lowe told McDonnell Douglas, Look, if you are interested in keeping your C-17 and building a strategic airlifter, I think you ought to be interested in bidding on the Air Force One. Quoted, 
What Lowe knew that he wasn't quite clear to McDonnell Douglas was that Defense Secretary Caspar Weinberger was considering cancellation of the C-17 project and would instead go to Boeing's proposal for a new CX alternative based on the 747. McDonnell Douglas submitted a proposal based on the DC-10. They produced a book in 1985 called C-10, The Presidential Aircraft with details about their proposal. The C-10 was centered around the DC-10-30 as the baseline aircraft because of its longer endurance range, time in service, and in-service reliability. The offering had integrated air stairs at the center main passenger and rear doors on the port side, and numerous options including in-flight refueling. For comparison purposes, McDonnell Douglas compared the C-10 to an equivalent competitive aircraft the Boeing 747SP, which is a shorted version compared to the Boeing 747 Classic family, not the proposed 747-200. The C-10 was also presented as an aircraft that can operate from many more airports than the 747SP could not. Comfort, performance, and reliability was based on the commercial DC-10 counterpart. McDonnell Douglas showed the DC-10 as a 17% less expensive per flight versus the 747SP with an estimated operating cost of $30,000 for a 2,000 nautical mile trip, using $1 per gallon fuel cost from 1983, and that the maintenance and fuel costs as being 37% more efficient versus the Boeing aircraft, using a Boeing performance report. McDonnell Douglas took another dig at the Boeing 747 by noting that it couldn't utilize the existing hangars at Andrews Air Force Base. And the Air Force had already estimated a new hangar facilities would add another $40 million to the cost of operating any 747. The C-10 could use the existing hangar facilities. The C-10 even included a proposed floor plan that featured a stateroom in the front of the aircraft and a radio operating station in place of the forward galley, which has been moved in front of the main door entrance. Medical and conference facilities were mapped out, as well as sections identified for traveling staff, executives, and areas for media. The rear featured a full galley as well as stairs to the lower deck, while the front galley had a lift to the lower deck. The McDonnell Douglas proposal was substantially lower than Boeing's proposal and had the desired effect that General Lowe had wanted. Boeing dropped the price in their proposal from nearly $1 billion for two modified aircraft to just $249 million in a fixed price contract, according to the General. In the end, Lowe's pressure on McDonnell Douglas to submit a proposal for a VC-137 replacement was a win-win for both the Air Force and McDonnell Douglas. The Air Force saved nearly $700 million, which is $1.6 billion adjusted for inflation in today's money, and it won the brownie points for McDonnell Douglas at the Air Force. Negating a so sore bid from Boeing, Boeing was awarded the newly designated VC-25 contract to build a replacement aircraft for the VC-137s and the rest is history. In the end, however, Seligman notes in her article that Boeing had to absorb nearly $600 million in unforeseen costs before the first VC-25 was delivered and entered the service, bringing that actual cost of each aircraft to approximately $425 million each. This figure does not include the upgrades to the VC-25 fleet over the years after delivery. Lowe maintained in the article that every presidential aircraft, every single part from the airframe to the rivets should have been competitive bids to ensure the Air Force and the taxpayer receives the value for their money. The C-10 never became Air Force One. It was a long shot from the beginning. With less space, just three engines, and a mixed public perception of the jet, the odds were not in favor of McDonnell Douglas. It remains a unique footnote in aviation history, leaving many app geeks to wonder what could have been after all these years. This article was written by Brian Wickham. 
Brian is a passionate aviation enthusiast. Having started the model company JetX, producing two aviation documentary films, and is now about to release a complete story on the British Aerospace BAE 146 for Legit Press, a new aviation book publisher. He maintains an aviation website called AvGeekTV.com. Many thanks for watching, and please like, comment, subscribe, and share.